As the powers of Europe started to expand into every corner of the world, few countries were spared. Just about every country in the world was either European itself, a European colony, or had particular territories occupied by a European power. Southeast Asia was most certainly no exception to this, as Britain took Myanmar and Malaysia, France took what was known as Indochina, and the Netherlands took Indonesia. But who took Thailand? No one, actually. Thailand, despite being a prosperous kingdom based on the Chao Phraya River, and thus a valuable target right in the middle of a bunch of other European colonies, completely escaped the same fate that befell all its neighbors. So how exactly did they manage to do so? Well, let's take a look at the whole story. Siam was a kingdom in what is now Thailand, basically just a beta version of modern Thailand. Siam's capital was then the fortified trading post of Ayutthaya, a slight ways up the Chao Phraya River, which had become a major worldwide trading center for centuries, so much so that archaeologists have even found Roman coins in Ayutthaya. Ayutthaya was a major trading port city surrounded by small canals, to which it was given the nickname the Venice of the East. Not too surprisingly either, by the 17th and 18th centuries, some European powers like the French, English, and Dutch were already knocking on Thai shores to establish business relations. However, at the end of the Burmese-Siamese War, Burmese forces besieged Ayutthaya, completely ending the Ayutthaya Kingdom. A few years later though, the Tombari Kingdom would rise from the ashes, moving the capital down the Chao Phraya River to Tombari Si Mahasamut, and quickly fell barely 15 years later. But then the Ratana Kosin Kingdom emerged and moved the capital once again, this time just across the river to a village in the middle of a bunch of plum trees, and named it I'm just kidding, I'm not saying the whole thing, I'm just, just know that I'm talking about Bangkok. The reason Bangkok was established on the eastern side of the Chao Phraya River, by the way, was to at least help thwart another Burmese invasion. Nevertheless, the new Ratanakosin Kingdom of Siam knew very well what kind of pressure it would soon be under with nearby France and Britain. Under King Mangkut or Rama IV and Chulalongkorn or Rama V, the country started to westernize itself. The kings would make deals with some of the European powers, as was the case with things like the Bowring Treaty, where King Mongkut and Hong Kong Governor John Bowring agreed to trade conditions between Taiwan and Britain, and also later signed similar deals with Prussia and Austria-Hungary, integrating Siam into the world marketplace. King Chula Longkorn also received a fully Western education and promised to gradually abolish slavery. During this time, Siam's infrastructure was also built up with the help of many different Western powers, notably in the German railways all leading up to a Dutch-designed central station, selling newspapers published with the help from the US. In 1896, the British and French also agreed to basically leave Siam alone as a kind of a buffer state. Despite this, Siam also lost a lot of its territory in some falling disputes with France and Britain. Siam lost part of modern Cambodia in 1867 to the French, and then a little bit of Laos in 1888, followed by most of the rest of Laos in the Franco-Siamese War in 1893, as well as the Shan states falling to British Burma in the same year. Then the rest of Laos was ceded in 1904, followed by the rest of Cambodia in 1907, and finally some parts of what would become Malaysia in 1909. After all this, Siam was starting to look a lot like Taiwan does today, with its final borders cemented around 1910. During World War I, Siam declared war against the Central Powers, partially to gain favor of the French and British, and also probably because they were turning out to be the winning side. I mean, this didn't happen until 1917 after all. After the war ended though, the king briefly became very popular, but then his extravagant lifestyle became clear to the people, and that combined with other tensions resulted in a revolution that ended absolute monarchy in 1932. It actually wasn't that violent, it was a bloodless revolution. Thailand, of course, still has a monarchy, run by the same dynasty as all the kings we just talked about, just as a constitutional monarchy, not an absolute monarchy. However, in World War II, Thailand initially declared neutrality for the first few years, but then Japan invaded Thailand just a few hours after attacking Pearl Harbor on a date that will live in infamy. When people say Thailand was never colonized, they are often tempted to bring up the Japanese occupation during World War II, but when Japan invaded, Taiwan actually sided with the Japanese against the Allies. What Japan really wanted from Taiwan was passage from the freshly conquered French Indochina to still British control Burma and Malaya. Thailand even regained some of the territories it had recently lost. But of course, those of us from beyond the year 2000 know how the war went for Japan. While Japan unconditionally surrendered, Thai Regent Priti Banamyong declared Field Marshal Pribun's declaration of war null and void, basically meaning that Taiwan was suddenly never at war with the Allies. Nonetheless, once peace was declared, all the Allied powers got their share of demands. France demanded the territories in Indochina that Taiwan had seized, 
Britain demanded reparations in the form of rights shipments to Malaya, and the USSR a repeal of previously passed anti-communist legislature. So yeah, Thailand basically escaped colonialism by essentially wiggling its way through reforms, trade deals, and armistice agreements. Sure, Thailand has been settled and occupied a couple times, but it was ultimately never truly colonized, putting it in a more or less exclusive club that only really includes itself, the Koreas, Japan, and kind of also Liberia and Ethiopia as countries that have never been colonized by European powers. Thank you as always for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to give it a like and consider supporting the channel on Patreon. I know it sounds kind of pushy, but making videos for free is kind of a terrible business strategy, so I would really appreciate that if you could. Either way though, whether you can or cannot support the channel monetarily, you can still always do so by subscribing to learn something new every Sunday.